I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to today's uh, panel on uh, Emma Gilga's excellent book. Does anyone have a copy just to show you the cover? this. Uh, Terror in Chechnya, uh, now out with Princeton University Press. And Emma, we're delighted uh, that you joined us for this, what should be uh, an interesting discussion, not only about your book, but also some of, I think, the themes that the book brings up in terms of Chechnya. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel, both policymakers and academics, in the spirit of the seminar series that Jack Snyder and I are co-directing on human rights strategies and outcomes. And part of the intent is to bring dialogue between the two communities on, on actual how effective certain strategies are, what are the policy implications, the legal implications, and so forth. So this fits really well. And thank you to Laura for uh, organizing everything and, and really uh, having the idea uh, to do this as, as part of the series. We're, we're very grateful. So uh, today's panel uh, is uh, comprised of four members. Uh, Emma uh, Gilgan, after, is, after completing her doctoral studies in Russian history at the University of Melbourne, uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History at the University of Chicago. Uh, now she is, it's not in your bio, but you're at the University of Connecticut. That's correct. Right. Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, <laughs> make, make sure that's there. Uh, she is uh, the author of two important books. Uh, the first, uh, Routledge 2004, Defending Human Rights in Russia, Sergei Kovalyov, Dissident and Human Rights Commissioners, 1969-96. Uh, and her second book, Terror in Chechnya, the subject of today's debate, uh, Russia and the Tragedy of Civilians in the War, Princeton University Press, 2009. So the book examines the war crimes committed by Russian soldiers against the civilian population of Chechnya, and the study places the conflict in Chechnya within international discourse on humanitarian intervention in the 1990s and the rise of nationalism in Russia. Emma has also contributed op-ed and policy articles in places like Chicago Tribune and International Herald Tribune, and she's a member of the Gladstein Committee for Human Rights and the Joint Higher Human Rights Institute. Uh, welcome. Uh, Kim Martin uh, is uh, my colleague uh, at Barnard College and distinguished professor of political science. She's also a faculty member of Harriman Institute, a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She has written three books, all on various cutting edge topics in international security, enforcing the peace learned from the imperial past, weapons, culture, and self interest, Soviet defense managers in New Russia, Columbia was president in 1997, and engaging the enemy organization theory in Soviet military innovation, Princeton University Press, 1993, for which she received the acclaimed Marshall Shulman Prize. Her writings have appeared in a number of scholarly journals, uh, and also she's given a number of policy pieces in places like the New York Times and the International Herald Review. Uh, she's also uh, conducted uh, uh, two open source contract projects with the Director of Net Assessment at the Pentagon. So she, as an academic, also bridges the policy world. And she has just finished a great new book, forthcoming from Cornell University Press. Uh, at some point it will be, I'm not jinxing it, I'm confident, uh, on warlords and state sovereignty, uh, uh, in which she includes a chapter on Ramzan Kadira of Chechnya. And so, Kim, we're, we're grateful to have your insights on comparative warlordism uh, in Chechnya. Uh, Jason Lyle, a PhD, Cornell University, currently assistant professor of political science at Yale University. He's also director of undergraduate studies, and he's affiliated with institutions for social and policy studies and the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. He's working currently on three projects. What else is new? Those of you know this, he's like one of the most interesting uh, minds in the field, even at his sort of young age, and also always is finds... That, is that on? It is on. <laughs> it's always just really interesting, provocative stuff. So he's looking at how state violence affects public attitudes and insurgent violence in Afghanistan, Iraq, Russia's North Caucasus. Uh, he's uh, published in all sorts of great places, including International Organization, Journal of Conflict Resolution, and he's won uh, many different prizes. So, uh, 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 oh, and of course, uh, Jason's uh, flagship publication for has been a piece about Chechnya and insurgency in the American Political Science Review, uh, which is rare enough for IIR. So welcome, Jason. And finally, last but not least, uh, Deirdre Blumen is a senior researcher with the Health and Human Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. He leads the organization's research and advocacy on palliative care and pain treatment. 
Uh, his work has exposed mass suffering from severe but unnecessary pain by patients worldwide with cancer, HIV, and other health conditions uh, because many countries fail to make an expensive, safe, and effective medications. Uh, Mr. Lohman has conducted supervised research uh, in India, Kenya, Ukraine, and various other countries. He's spearheaded, spearheaded advocacy. Uh, uh, Commission on Narcotics and Drugs, the International Narcotics Control Board, the World Health Organization, and other institutions to address these issues. And he's also worked with the Europe from 1997-2006 and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. First with Moscow Office Director in 1997-2002, then as Senior uh, Researcher for Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. So in those capacities, he exposed systematic torture of police precincts in Russia and in the Russian Army, and covered abuses committed in the armed conflict in Chechnya. Uh, I cannot think of four more qualified individuals to take on this task. So I've gone on long enough. Uh, I will ask Emma to begin with the presentation about 15 minutes on the main findings, points in her book. Uh, then I'll uh, ask Kim, Jason, and Deirdre in that order to add their 12 minutes <coughs> engaging with Emma's book and any other arguments that they want to make. And then I'll ask the panelists to hold over debates and comments for each other. Uh, to after the presentation. So, Emma, welcome and thank, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me without the microphone? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Well, I might take 10 minutes and then five minutes for my defense <laughs> after the three people have given their uh, synopsis of my work, if that's all right. Um, thanks again to the Harriman Institute and to Lara and your colleagues for organizing this. It's nice to be here. I must say that. Uh, I wish in a way that you'd uh, organise this when my uh, book manuscript uh, was still in draft form uh, and I could have got your feedback then, but nevertheless I, I'm looking forward to, to hearing your comments today. I realise actually that uh, colleagues here are going to talk about the text uh, of the book and I look forward to, to hearing and, and being able to discuss that. So. What I thought I'd do with my little time is to talk to you a little bit about what my aim and my purpose was with writing this book, and just to give you some context about where I was coming from. So I have to admit that my initial aims are very modest. I wasn't really trying to uh, create any new uh, intellectual territory. I wasn't trying to come up with any new uh, necessary philosophies or political ideas. What I was trying to do was to bring together the information that was available at a particular moment in historical time into a compact setting in which undergraduates and those interested readers could actually open up a book and find out about one dimension of the crisis in Chechnya. I know that other scholars such as Matthew Evangelista and John Dunlop um, and James Hughes have done a great deal of work of looking at the political side of this conflict and trying to understand the causal origins of that, of the conflict itself. So I felt having, I was living in Russia twice, um, both during the first war between uh, 1992, or, or actually, sorry, 1994 and 1996, and then uh, I was there again from 1994 to 2002. So I seemed to be uh, living inside the country at two uh, very extreme moments. And I think that part of the motivation was seeing the difference within the reaction of the Russian public uh, to the second war as opposed to the first war. And this struck me as quite extreme uh, and I was curious to try and understand some of the motivations behind that change. Um, so essentially I wanted to put everything together so people had access to try and understand uh, exactly what we know about the crisis. I wanted to make very clear that as Diedrich well knows that with access to only 30 percent of the territory there's so much that we don't know. And so I wanted to make a couple of proposals or things that I wanted people to talk about. This was what do we do in asymmetrical wars when you actually don't have access to information. Um, so my plea initially when I was at the University of Chicago was for a large documentation project and I know obviously that Memorial and 
the Russian Chechen Friendship Society uh, have also been working on that. But I think that there is a need to, to actually promote that further. So I wanted to open up that discussion about the fact that, his, that victims really are always at a historical disadvantage, right? So how do we regenerate a discussion of the victims? And to me, the only way to do that is actually to, as much as possible, document what's happened to them. Um, so I, at UConn now, where I am in the Human Rights Institute, we're actually starting a pilot project with some of the refugees in, uh, the 16,000 Chechen refugees living in Austria. Um, so we're starting a pilot project there to try and uh, gather people to talk about their experiences. Uh, and we're also hoping to start up a website where people can actually also put their experiences online. This is very experimental. Um, it's problematic on a number of levels that we're all very aware of, but it's a way for us to, I guess, try and generate more information for, for our purposes um, as much as for the purposes of enlightening people as to what has taken place. Um, so I think that's essentially what all I wanted to say. I just wanted to outline what, what my aims were, and I think that bringing forth the discussion about documentation, bringing forth the discussion about okay, how do we categorize exactly what's taken place in Russia? And can we do that um, without having all the documentation that we need at hand to make claims about how we categorize this by, the, by international law, for example? So I did want to also open up that discussion. The last and final thing that I want to say is that I was very interested in the idea of public hearings or the idea of non-government tribunals, um, particularly in cases like this where there is no international funding, where there are no truth and reconciliation commissions. Um, and so there isn't the support there for people to come out and be able to testify about things that have happened to them. Um, so um, they were my aims, uh, I think, briefly, and uh, so then I'll allow the others to, um, to talk about their impressions and also then I perhaps have a, an opportunity to respond sure. to that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, Emma Gilligan has succeeded brilliantly. This is a very powerful book. Um, she provides a really detailed history of the true horror of Russian behavior in Chechnya. And I think it's a definitive account that includes lots of examples that aren't found elsewhere. I think she also is very correct in dismissing the United States and United Nations reaction to what was happening in Chechnya as being focused on other political and security motives and largely ignoring the plight of the Chechen people. And she usefully points out that this started under President Bill Clinton. It was not just an artifact of the War of Terror. Um, I think that she's also correct in calling out the Russian government for its failure to follow the Geneva Conventions. Um, she makes it very clear that Russia committed uh, terrible war crimes and also committed crimes against humanity. Um, sometimes during the era of the Putin presidency in particular, I was on panels with Russian scholars and any time that the Russians were criticized for what they were doing in Chechnya, the answer would always be, oh, you have no right to criticize us because the United States is doing the same thing in Iraq or the United States is doing the same thing in Afghanistan. And I think this book makes clear that what was happening in Chechnya was not just individual soldiers who committed torture or murder in Chechnya. It was not just state errors in judgment about targeting that happened in Chechnya. It actually was state policy to target Chechen civilians for brutal attack. And that didn't start under Putin, but it continued under Putin. Um, and so I think you know the, the book makes clear that the Russian state, especially under the Putin presidency, um, really um, had no real concern about human rights questions. And for all of those reasons, the book is incredibly powerful and incredibly valuable. That having been said, there are two parts of the book that I take issue with. Um, and both of the parts that I take issue with come from the work that I have done um, looking at the Chechnya case, as Alex mentioned in the book, that has not yet been accepted by Cornell, even though it's submitted there and under consideration there. Um, and so in the book, which is about warlords and sovereignty, I talk about Ramzan Kadyrov, um, who is the current leader of the Chechen Republic, who was appointed to that position by Vladimir Putin. So the two parts of the book that I take issue with. The first is um, that I don't think that um, Emma Gilligan has a sufficiently nuanced discussion of the motives of Chechen fighters. Um, she's careful to be balanced. 
She talks about um, war crimes and crimes against humanity that were, conduct were committed by Chechen fighters against um, the Russian population, um, as well as what um, Russian uh, 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 people did to the Chechens. Um, but I think she's very quick to label the motive of Chechen violence as being revenge for Russian atrocities. Um, and even though she does a very good job of documenting the different times that Chechen fighters targeted Russians, I think maybe she's a little bit too quick to forgive the Chechens for the acts of violence that they committed. Um, and I'm sure that revenge is a big part of what the Chechen fighters um, were doing, but in the book, the real only alternative that she considers to revenge um, is Islamism and religious belief. And the literature on the causes of rebellion and the causes of political violence has a vast range of motives um, that have been detailed and studied by scholars. Both revenge and ideological or religious belief are important, um, but so is political economy. Um, by political economy, um, these scholars mean just the desire by particular individuals or particular groups to have control over resources and control over pieces of territory. And it's important to keep in mind that the Chechen wars were not simply about the Russians versus the Chechens. Many Chechen militias formed before the Russian invasion happened um, in the sense that they grew out of organized crime groups. Um, Russian militias fought each other for control over territory um, and resources as well as fighting against the Russians. Um, and so violence inside Chechnya in a sense predated um, this most recent uh, 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 a number of Russian attacks on Chechnya, and we can't look at the whole situation as just being a black and white Russian versus Chechen situation. And I think that, that one of the things that's important to keep in mind when we're looking at this is that there were all kinds of violent rivalries between Ramzan Kadyrov um, and um, various militias that fought against him uh, during the Chechen wars for control over territory. And the particular one that has gotten the most attention is his fighting with the Yamadaya family, the Ahmadiyyavs had started out in an alliance with the Kadyrovs, um, but they became competitors for political control. And uh, there were killings of two brothers from the Yamadaya family in 2008 in Moscow and 2009 in Dubai. There was an attempted killing of a third in Moscow in 2009 that was thwarted by the Moscow authorities. And we don't know for sure that Kadyrov's people were responsible for this, but there's pretty good evidence that probably it was indeed a result of the rivalries. Um, so one thing to keep in mind um, is that this is often reported as blood feuds, and certainly there are blood feuds that are a part of the Chechen culture, but calling everything a blood feud is e also a way for Ramzan Kadyrov not to take responsibility for his own role um, in violence um, that occurs. And so I think we need to take the claims of blood feuds um, with a grain of salt. So just because the Chechen civilians are victims, which I think Emma Gilligan does a really good job of describing, it doesn't mean that individuals among them and significant individuals among them were not also perpetrators. So the label of civilian does not necessarily connote innocence, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind um, when reading Emma Gilligan's book. The second um, problem that I have with the book is that I think that the book overreaches when it claims that the Russian state pursued genocide in Chechnya. Um, Emma Gilligan says- I don't no say that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you have a discussion of genocide significantly throughout the first chapter. Yeah, but I don't say that it's genocide. Okay, I misinterpreted it then. Yeah. I apologize. That's all right. Um, but what I want to talk about, even though she didn't say that it was <laughs> genocide, um, is um, that the important thing to keep in mind is that, uh, and going along with the idea that the violence includes Chechen on Chechen violence and not just Russian versus Chechen violence, um, is that Putin selected the people um, who are uh, now uh, ruling Chechnya um, uh, and have been since 2003, and much of the, the horrible brutality um, against the Chechens is continuing, even though you can make a good argument, and I do in my book chapter, um, that the Russian state has essentially lost control over what's happening in Chechnya. Um, in, essentially what happened is that um, uh, Putin created a warlord in Chechnya. Um, the first person that he appointed to be the head of Chechnya, Chechnya was named Ahmed Kadyrov. Um, he was somebody who was extraordinarily controversial at home in Chechnya, had almost no um, uh, legitimate political authority uh, among Chechens. Um, and then when he died in an attack, he was replaced by his son Ramzan, um, who effectively had no political experience. And you can trace out very clearly how Putin selected Ramzan 
in uh, contrast to uh, several other possible contenders and really ensured, including through campaigns of violence that Ramzan himself conducted or appeared to conduct, um, that there would be nobody else um, who would be a, a, a rival for Ramzan's control. And what this means is that starting in about 2005 and um, being finalized in 2009 and 2010, Russia effectively gave up sovereignty in Chechnya. Gradually, they granted Kadyrov and his militia the legal right to control security operations and policing on the territory with almost no Russian oversight at this point because Ramzan and his militia have operational control over what's happening. So, for example, recently we've heard a lot about uh, laws that have been passed in Chechnya um, that have to deal with uh, women's issues and family issues. For example, women having to wear headscarves or women not being allowed to divorce their husbands and having to be obedient to their husbands. And these laws don't reflect the laws that are in place in the rest of Russia, but the Russians are not, the Russians, the non-Chechen Russians are not the people who are responsible for uh, enforcing these laws. It's uh, Ramzan Kadyrov's militia that does the enforcing. So you can make the argument that on the one hand, um, Russia did this for rational reasons um, because Ramzan Kadyrov has done a very good job of turning people who were against the Russian state um, in terms of the drive for autonomy uh, in Chechnya. Um, often he has done this through threats of violence or through acts of violence and torture um, against the people that he wanted to turn to towards his side. Um, but as Sergei Markadonov points out, Ramzan Kadyrov has not succeeded in uh, eliminating the threat of uh, terrorism that emanates from the North Caucasus. And you can make a very good argument that what Kadyrov did was essentially just push the terrorists off of Chechen territory onto the territory of other places in the North Caucasus. And so it's not clear that Russia got a very good bargain um, for what it did with Ramzan Kadyrov. And what it really uh, indicates um, is that Russia chose to wash its hands of responsibility for what happened in Chechnya. Conceptually, that's not so different from the choices that the U.S. might have made in Iraq and that NATO has made in Afghanistan. Um, the levels of horrific violence are maybe not the same, uh, quite the same in those two cases uh, currently as what we've seen in Chechnya, but it's still the same situation of an outside power um, effectively deciding that it didn't want to spend the resources to manage a territory and therefore selecting um, people on the ground that it felt comfortable working with um, to have control over security uh, situations in selected regions in its place. But the one thing that really stands uh, apart from the Russian Chechen example is that Chechen is on Russian territory. This was not an outside power practicing indirect control over a piece of territory. It was Russia practicing indirect control on a piece of its own territory. Um, and I think that in, in many senses um, that makes the, the Chechen situation unique. And it says something important about Russia today as well. Sometimes there's a tendency to see Putin's rule um, as being uh, evidence that Russia is once again a strong state, um, that, that Russia has regained uh, its sense of strength after the close of the Cold War. And I think the example of Chechnya and the outsourcing of sovereignty in Chechnya indicates that in fact Russia is terribly, terribly weak. It did not have the resources, it did not have the political will to maintain legal control over the security forces on a piece of its own territory and in return for giving up that control, it really has not gotten much um, in terms of making itself more secure, as the damage of a bombing um, of uh, January uh, makes clear. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Jason. Uh, I get 12 minutes for Emma, and then I'll respond to Kim. It's already, it's already starting up here. Um, I think it's a sign of a great book when you have lots and lots of questions, and I'm going to throw more on the table here. Uh, I think you succeeded brilliantly. I agree with Cam that this is fantastic. Um, one of the problems of studying this conflict is that not all the material is in one place. And a lot of it's actually not in English. And I think that's a huge service just to put this all in one place so we can actually get a sense of what the picture actually looks like in this conflict. And that's one of the most of the frustrating things as a teacher, somebody who actually works in the region as well, to send my students somewhere. It's very, very difficult. There actually isn't a text that we can send them to and until now. And I think so this is going to be a great resource for people who want to actually springboard into doing their own research as well. So I think that, and when you set up your goals, I think I agree with Kim, succeeded brilliantly. But this is no fun if we just say how good you are, right? So, so let, let, me, let me raise some issues and, uh, and some questions coming out of my own research. And, and the 10 second version of my own research is that um, I've spent a considerable amount of time in Russia from 2000 to 2005 working in and around the Caucasus, particularly looking at the patterns of violence in the Caucasus. 
both by the Russian side as well as by the Chechen insurgent side. Uh, my time in Russia has come to an abrupt end because I was thrown out of the country for the work that I did, um, but now uh, it looks like I've had sat out in the corner for about five years and now I'm good, I'm allowed to go back in. So hopefully, uh, like you're finishing your book, hopefully I'm allowed to go back in the summer and start up again. So, uh, so this for me is exciting because I get to get back into the game in some ways. And so um, let, me, let me just raise three questions or, or think, push you on sort of three issues. Uh, one's on the state, one's on the rebel, and one's on the people themselves. And by the people, I mean the Russians who are watching the conflict go on, as well as the Chechens within Chechnya as well. And on the first, on what the Russians are doing, uh, the book is, is amazingly detailed on the sort of nitty gritty of what actually is going on. But I, I kept waiting for you to step back and put the pieces together for me. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to hear was actually your argument about what was going on. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you, you step back and let the facts speak for themselves, and, and as much as we know anyway, and you're right, 20 to 30% of Chechnya we know quite well, and the rest is kind of up in the air. Um, but, but I kept trying to figure out, what is your argument for explaining not only the origins of the conflict, but the way in which it was fought? Mm -hmm. So why is it this brutal? Right. What was the reason behind this? It didn't have to be necessarily, right? So, so why did it unfold in the way that it did? And the, my best guess on your answer actually comes to where you believe that nationalism and, and racism or sort of radical notions of race on the Russian side really drove the dynamics of the conflict. And I think I, think I take that as your thesis. And part of what worries me about that is that the racism and the nationalism is not a cause of the conflict, it's a consequence of it. So it is actually being driven, right? You're getting this progressive nationalist rhetoric, this progressively brutalizing activities on the ground, not because of some pre-standing Russian hatred of Chechens ethnically, although it may be there. Yeah, historically, right? There's a 200-year legacy. But it also is being fueled by the conflict itself. And in some ways, I think you have this easy case to make where you sort of say, well, there's a 200-year of history, and this is just round six or seven or eight or nine, depending on how you're counting on it, right? I'm actually, but I think that's too easy. Right, because I think what you need to be able to do is demonstrate where the racism is playing a role relative to areas in which it's not. And so I started looking around and started saying, well, there are some odd puzzles in here. If your story about nationalism and racism are, is correct, there are some things I think we shouldn't see in the conflict, but we actually do. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me raise two, um, two points here. One is it strikes me as odd to see the variation in the location and the intensity of the brutality inflicted on the people. If this is a story about Russian racism or Russian nationalism, why is there variation in how the people are being treated? And let me just show you, this is something from what I'm, partly from my own work here, of course. Is <laughs> Windows is updating itself. Well, if you could see it. <laughs> Alex, thanks, let me try that one more time. Oh, I'm gonna have, oh no, here we go, yeah. Here. So just very simply, this, this is some of the same data that you're using in your book uh, followed by memorials, internal records, some of the human rights activists, things who are people who are keeping documentary record of the activities of the Russians. And these are, these are the locations of the sweep operations in that middle third of Chechnya over uh, 2000 to 2005. There's about 680 of them. The one thing to note is actually the spatial variation. Of it. Some places are absolutely ransacked 40 times, 30 times, right? Some places get swept once and that's about it, twice, three times. That's the smaller dots in here, right? Uh, some places never are swept at all in this conflict. And so for somebody to say, well, it's racism, it's nationalism, that to me says, why am I seeing this? Why isn't all of Chechnya sacked? Why do I observe this variation on the behavior of the Russian soldiers themselves? And you actually, in the conclusion, point out that the, the uh, contract soldiers behave differently than the conscript soldiers did. And so now there's a little bit of nuance in the story about what is this Russian racism, but but I don't know where that, I mean, we can imagine where that comes from, but why is it operative in some places, not others, right? Why does it seem to drive the conflict in some places, but again, and not in others? And so I think I'm just, for me, I'm skeptical of these really big cultural factors that don't really move, right? There's just Russian racism uh, and perhaps Chechen racism in return, but there's all this kind of variation in the location and the intensity of the violence. To me, the, the racism is not really driving this. It might actually be coming back out of the conflict, but it seems to me that the burden of proof, if you're going to make that claim, is actually on you to tell us how is it that it can simultaneously explain the conflict, explain the patterns, explain the variation in the observed violence. And so to me, that's, that's just too far of a reach, I think, for the racism and the nationalism card. But maybe you've got uh, uh, you know, a nuanced explanation you can get back, and that's maybe in your five minutes. But um, on the Russian side, there's a lot of variation that I think is not really explained. The other thing is, is from that point of view, it strikes me as incredibly odd that Chechens would leave the, re the rebellion or the various insurgent groups and join the Russian side. 
if this is a conflict about race and ethnicity and nationalism, why is it that there are so many rebels breaking ranks and joining the Russian side? In fact, really, 2003, 2004, when these units are stood up, east, west, and then you finally get north and south, uh, these battalions, uh, and as well as Ramzan's own forces as well. Why are you getting this massive defection out of the insurgency? Mm -hmm. Why are they defecting to what you would imagine as their racial enemies? And in fact, to the point where in 2004, 2005, right, the number of Chechens who are actually fighting against Chechen rebels vastly outnumbers the number of rebels. By 2005, the numbers, I mean, these, you know, the estimates are soft, but the, the numbers are about 1,000, 500 fighters still left. Mm -hmm. Right? At some points in the height, in the pro-Russian Chechen militias, up to 20,000 soldiers. And so this strikes me as that you get this bleed out of the insurgency. What is it? A, is it really about race? Is it really about nationalism? Why aren't the rebels basically looking at the, che uh, the Russians and saying, they're giving us no mercy, they're giving us no quarter, they're our racial enemies, we've been doing this for 200 years, there is no quarter, we can't go across, we can't cross lines. But they do, and they do it in droves. And sometimes they surrender en masse. So that strikes me as there's something else going on in the conflict that's not really about the race card, it's really not about the nationalism card. And I think actually that's where Kim picked up on the genocide side. I picked up on that too. And I didn't think that you were necessarily claiming that it was a genocide, but I think you were, you were definitely making the, um, the argument that the targeting was ethnic in nature. No, right. I said we couldn't prove that. We, we could, okay, we couldn't prove that. But there's a lot of examples in here where you're trying to, I think, you see this is the thing, you're walking, I think you're walking right up to that line yeah, yeah. and looking over it <laughs> and saying, well, I'm not going to call it a genocide, but there's a lot of things that are suggestive yeah. of it. And yeah. I think that's okay, because, I mean, well, how can you, I mean, it's very difficult to claim that such an enormous right. uh, violation of international law has taken place, first without full documentation that that's taken place. Right. And also, I think, if you're going to talk about genocide, then the horrific nature of genocide is the fact that the intent is to kill one of these groups. So you do need to be able to prove that intent. And I, I don't agree. think in this case, uh, and that's part of my argument, that we have sufficient knowledge to actually make that, that claim. Right. And if I could just ask you, oh. about, we'll give you 10 minutes. After this. <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry, I'll yeah. Display <laughs> everyone here as much time as you like, actually. So yeah, we'll just look through the yeah, but no, no, that no, does. But I, but I still, I, I think I'm with Kim on this one. You do, there are there's suggestive pieces of evidence yet you use that basically lend credence. You, but you're careful, right? You say that we don't have all the documentation. We're never going to have all the documentation, right? Uh, and so I think you walk right up to that line and don't. But that's part of the argument you're making is it's driven by, this is a broader point, is that it's driven by racial notions, right? Racial prejudice and nationalism. And my argument is that there are other alternative explanations at work that, that these factors have to be proven and against other social science theories about what's driving these conflicts, including revenge, including operating motives of the Russian soldiers, including theft and corruption, all these other reasons for the why the violence is the way it is. And so, um, and so now I think I've used my 10 minutes on my one point, so I'm gonna go a little faster on the other ones. Uh, the second point is, is the rebels, for me, are still a bit of mystery in the book. And I do think that there, this is very much documenting Russian crimes. There is one chapter on the, on the rebels uh, I, I agree with Kim. I, I, you know, I think there is the political economy side is, is missing a bit, but actually, it's actually harder just to get a sense of who the rebels are in the book. And I, partly because this is not your fault, partly because there isn't an insurgency. There are multiple insurgent groups, right? And they sometimes fight with one another. They have very different motives and assertions. And and so where I where I sort of push hard on what you're doing is I don't think this radicalization narrative, the, the insurgents becoming progressively Islamic, actually holds. Uh, and so there is a wing of the insurgency that it has become progressively radicalized, no question. But there's a huge schism inside the movement, even today, between sort of more nationalist forces and more radical groups, and they struggle for dominance of the movement. And the, the thing that I, that, I mean, it's, this is a sort of commonly repeated idea, right, that the movement has become progressively Islamic, progressively radicalized. Yet if you look at the suicide bombings, right, they actually go down. The heyday of suicide bombing in Chechnya is 2001. 2002. After that, it's a steady decline in the use of these tactics. In fact, there's a huge movement uh, inside the overall movement to actually sort of ban these, the use of this. They say it's not working. It's, it's alienating the people. And so if you look at the, the number of suicide attacks inside Chechnya over time, the height is 2002. So, and it's been progressively dropping, which is a weird argument behaviorally for these sort of notions of radicalization, right? There have been these in terrorist groups and terrorist attacks outside of Chechnya, and we've seen, we've alluded to some, we've seen a number of them. Uh, it's not clear that those are Chechens, first of all, uh, because the conflict has spread out. 
And uh, it, it, second of all, it's maybe a single piece of the insurgency, but it's not the whole insurgency. And I think we lose sight of the fact that this movement is fractured, it's divided, and I think oftentimes there is just isn't a movement. Sometimes it is just simple revenge. People taking shots at Russian forces or now pro-Russian Chechen forces. And it isn't, they're not ascribed to any kind of movement. They're just taking revenge for something that's been inflicted on them. Uh, there are estimates that you know, up to 80% of the Taliban in Afghanistan operate in the same way, mm -hmm. where we say the Taliban. But isn't, there isn't a Taliban. And in fact, it may not even be a uni unified movement. I think this is very much the case in Chechnya, in part because the Russian state has shattered the insurgency. I mean, I think part of what gets lost a little bit in the gory details uh, of the book and, and of the conflict is that the Russians have largely won in Chechnya. And I think this raises a really interesting set of questions, both morally as well as uh, pragmatically. You know, what happens if you're a human rights activist who wants to decry these human rights abuses and the Russian state turns to you and says, but we're winning? Right? What, is the, what is the pushback to go sort of the theme of the human rights uh, on this panel and this speaking series? What is the leverage you can use if that state believes that this is the way in which it wins and is willing to sacrifice its own citizens to do this? I'm not clear what the arguments are, um, but if you look at these practices, that the insurgency has been largely circumscribed to a tiny corner of Chechnya now and has been largely marginalized. And partly that is just through sheer Russian use of brutality and force. Not all, right? There, you know, part of it has been the pro-Russian Chechen movement. Part of it has been this dumping of massive amounts of uh, reconstruction funds in, which has fed corruption, but it's allowed to buy off the rebels. So there is a soft power argument, which is not really in here. And the rebels have been, well, not even the rebels, the, the pro-Russian government in Chechnya has largely used force selectively, but a lot of carrots, too. And this kind of nuanced perspective, I think, gets lost. We, we code them as warlords, and I think Kim's right on this. But there's been actually a lot of strategies. It's not just that Ramzan is this brutal actor with a tiger. Uh, there's that side of them. Um, but there's also. That's not clear, and we can debate that in the discussion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so I think there actually is a, a calculated strategy. I also disagree. I think there is, uh, Putin has more control than I think um, we give him credit for over the situation. But we're not going to talk about that because you and I are not talking. Okay. You and I are not talking either. We're just we're talking here. Um, <laughs> so the last, one minute. Yeah, the last, just very quickly. Um, the one group of people I was really surprised were not in the book were Russians themselves. And I wonder what the Russians thought of this. There's very good poll data that most people after about two, early 2002 would support a political settlement in Chechnya. And there seems to be a general tiredness among the people for, of the war, and particularly the cost that they're paying, and, and particularly when there were conscripts, young kids going down, and there were their kids going down to fight, and were typically ill-equipped to do this. I mean, this is why you get a lot of this raiding and, and these sweep operations so they can get food. Right and 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 things and supplies, things of that nature, uh, and so I wondered what you thought of the the Russians and, and just the Russian people and, and having them look at this conflict, and how the human rights group interface with them. I mean, I, I spent the early 2000s with the human rights group standing on street corners, handing out leaflets and watching them hand out the leaflets, and people would just walk by, and I wonder if that was just because of Russian indifference, kind of like American indifference now in, in Afghanistan. Right? There's no hue and outcry. There's no movement. There's no pushback. There's nothing. It's just mm -hmm. happening somewhere else. And it's sufficiently distant from Moscow that it sort of is somewhere else. Um, or if that was something that the human rights groups weren't doing right. That there was a set of strategies that they could adopt, but they weren't getting over the wall that Putin had put up and were not being effective. And so when we stood out there and I froze my tail off in the deeps of, of Moscow and St. Petersburg winters, they would hand out broadsheets that had all the list of atrocities. Mm -hmm. And they would light a candle. And they'd stand out there for about 90 minutes, 100 minutes or so, and then they'd go home. And that was the extent of the outreach. They were there to be a symbol. And I always, often wondered that if there wasn't a real lost opportunity to engage the Russian people in terms that they understood. Not a moral crusade, but the fact that this is a pragmatic thing where blood and treasure is being spent on your behalf mm -hmm. and your school is not being funded. Mm -hmm. right? Or your, your 18-year-old son is going there and he does not want to go there and you don't want to go there. So I often wonder, like, where are the Russians in this story and how do they look at the conflict? And I'm going to absolutely stop right there. Thank you, Thank you Jason. Uh, Deirdre. Um, I frankly don't really know where to start <laughs> um, because there I've been trying to take notes of various things that both both of you said and um, things that you said Emma um, and um, there's a lot of things that I would like to um, to to respond to um, um, but I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit disjointed um, if I try to do that my um, 
Um, first of all, I think you've you've written a great book that is really readable um, for um, I think for you know for for anyone who has an interest in in, in the subject matter. Um, um, it's not just kind of scholarship, but very well well written um, uh, scholarship. Um, so congratulations on, uh, on on that. I'm the the the, the first uh, point that I was going to talk about is actually a point that both of you also made, um, <coughs> which is um, uh, kind of how you write about um, uh, about genocide and whether this was a genocide or not. Um, you stop short of calling it a genocide, but at the same time, you kind of Leave, you know, you leave the suggestion that it very well may have been, yeah. um, and <laughs> and I, um, uh, of course, I, working for for Human Rights Watch, um, um, one of the things that we did in the in the early or in the late 90s and, and early 2000s was actually do the documentation of of the human rights abuses that were um, that were taking place, and doing that work, it was never my feeling that this was a genocide. Um, we were not. I, I don't think the intent to destroy in part or in whole a, a particular population was there. Um, I think what we were looking at was a, uh, uh, an, an, an armed forces and police forces that were incompetent um, that had gotten certain, um, you know, they were they were they were given certain objectives that they um, they had to achieve. They had no idea how to do that. Um, they didn't have the uh, sophisticated material, <coughs> you know, um, um, equipment, etc., et cetera, that they needed to be able to do that. Um, um, they didn't have the kind of intellectual resources um, uh, to do it, um, and so. It, the, the, the conflict really degenerated into something where I think the racism that already existed, the hatred of the Chechens that already existed, um, I think that is really what turned it into such an abusive um, uh, conflict. But, but I don't think there was an intent to, uh, to, uh, to commit genocide. And I think if you look at the, uh, the map um, um, you put up, Jason, I, I think this <coughs> it, it illustrates very clearly how um, um, how in certain parts of uh, of, of Chechnya um, there was very you know there there weren't as many abuses. The north of Chechnya we documented very few abuses. There were a few disappearances, a few sweep operations, but it was really mostly in that middle stretch of um, um, of, of Chechnya, which is um, well most densely populated, but which is also kind of you know, edging on the on the mountains, which is where a lot of the rebel activity sprouted from. And so I think, I mean, when I, I I've spent a lot of time thinking about the disappearances that were happening. And as you, I mean, you talk in your book about you know three to five thousand uh, people who are estimated to have disappeared. Um, and, and I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, how did those disappearances actually happen? Why did this become such a wave of disappearances over uh, over the course of several years? And, and my sense is really that what, what what happened was that once the Russians had more or less established kind of nominal control over much of Chechnya's territory, um, the insurgency was still going on in you know all of these towns in Staryatagi and Urus Martan, etc. Um, all of those towns were supposed under Russian control, but the rebels were operating, you know, pretty openly um, and and pretty freely. And so I think what was happening was that the Russians would get an informant who would give a name. Uh, they would then pick up that person. They would torture that person until that person gave up, you know, gave more names. Then that person would be killed, would be dumped somewhere in a forest, and they would, you know, that kind of they went for the the, the people whose names were were mentioned, and they picked them picked them up, and the same thing happened with them. And so that kind of led to this, um, you know, this wave of, of disappearances. Um, but I, I don't think there was necessarily, you know, the, the intent to kill all of these people. I mean, this was part of a, a very, very poorly executed um, uh, military or policing strategy. Um, in which clearly um, Russian commanders did not give a hoot about what was happening to to Chechens, right? I mean, I think it's the it's the the negligence on the part of the leadership much more than that there were specific orders uh, to the um, to to soldiers to to commit these abuses. Um, so that's the first. Um, um, the the second point is. Um, 
uh, about the European Court, um, which of course um, you knew I was going <laughs> to I was going to talk about that um, because I, I was one of the one of the people who was very much involved in getting the um, getting applications to the European Court uh, from uh, from Chechen um, victims of, of, of abuses, um, and you you you, you say um, in um, uh, in the chapter on the court that um, it has a, uh, um, a controversial. That, it's a, that the role of the court is a controversial one, um, and <clears throat> uh, you kind—I mean—you explain why you think that it was, is a contro controversial one, but I, I think that's actually a bit of a mischaracterization of the role of the court, um, <clears throat> because the court has a particular mandate, um, and it is fulfilling that mandate, uh, and that mandate is not to uh, conduct criminal investigations, to try uh, people accused of, of war crimes or crimes against humanity. Um, it, it plays, you know, it plays the role of um, uh, adjudicating a case between an individual who claims their rights have, have been violated and, uh, and, and the country that is alleged to have committed that violation. Um, and so I think it's really more the, <clears throat> um, the, the, this court could only play this role. It's the fact that the international community didn't step up to the plate and say, what is happening in Chechnya are war crimes and are crimes against humanity. That means that there needs to be a response um, the way there was with Rwanda or with, um, with Yugoslavia that has kind of pushed the European Court of Human Rights into kind of the only institution that was you know that was hearing cases that was looking at the um, you know at the evidence and assessing the evidence. Um, so I think the court was kind of pushed into a role um, that it was never you know it was never meant to to play. Or maybe we or uh, Chechen civilians um, are kind of projecting what we would like to see on a court that doesn't have um, that that kind of jurisdiction. Um, and then um, um, you talked about a documentation center. Um, and I think uh, if we look at what uh, the numbers of cases that the European Court of Human Rights has, um, uh, has looked at so far, the number of judgments we have um, is, uh, I think, 165 um, uh, right now. Um, it's looked at uh, hundreds of, uh, of cases of, of disappearances, probably approaching about 10, you know, 10 percent of the uh, of the total estimated number of people who um, who have disappeared. There are still um, uh, uh, hundreds of cases pending before um, the the European Court of Human Rights, and so I think if we're if we're talking about creating the documentation, um, um, we're actually you know, through these court proceedings, we we have been generating an enormous amount of of of, of evidence. Uh, in some cases, evidence that very clearly pinpoints the the people in you know in the Russian forces in the Russian administration who were responsible for particular acts. Uh, in a lot of cases, of course, the court has documented um, uh, in great depth the the failures of the prosecutor's office in in Russia um, to to conduct real investigations allegations into the allegations that were put forward. Um, and so I think, you know, if, 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 we're, if we're thinking about documentation, here we have a treasure trove of, of good information. And also if we are, you know, if we do think about the possibility, who knows, one day that there could be, um, you know, a truth commission or, or, or criminal investigations into what has happened, obviously that's the first place to, to look because this is, you know, this is evidence that has already been validated by, uh, by a court of law uh, made up of, of leading judges from, uh, from all, over, uh, all over Europe. Um, um, going back a little bit to the role of the court, um, you, um, you cite someone uh, as talking about how, um, sorry, I just want to, um, so one Chechen civilian has concluded in stark terms that the role of the court is to force the Russian government to pay a fee for taking human life. And <clears throat> I think, um, um, I, I, I think that what the court has done actually goes well beyond uh, beyond that. Um, we when when we started. Um, 
Okay, uh, I can I can do this in two minutes. Um, when in, in in 19 or in 2000, um, when suddenly media attention for the conflict in Chechnya just ended, right? Um, Yeltsin had resigned. The whole world knew that Putin was going to be the next president. They were going to have to deal with this guy for the next four years and, and probably much more. Uh, international, uh, the EU, the U.S. didn't want to engage with, um, you know, on Chechnya any, anymore, or at least not the way they did in the first few weeks or months of the, of the conflict. Um, we, what we started, uh, what, what we did in, in late 2000 was go back and re-interview people um, who we had interviewed earlier about abuses that had happened to them or to family members, people whose relatives had disappeared, who'd been executed, um, victims of torture, um, to see to what extent the Russians were actually investigating their claims. And we had been, you know, documenting these claims, giving them to the Russians. They were saying, we are looking into this. So we went back and, it, and we found that none of the witnesses had ever been questioned. We found that bodies had been, you know, had been buried with all the bullets in them, with clothes on. None of the, you know, none of the forensics had, had been done. And at the same time, we found that, th that many of the victims had incredibly strong evidence um, of wrongdoing by Russian, by Russian forces. And so it felt almost criminal not to help these people bring their cases to the European Court of Human Rights. But when we started talking to these people about, the, you know, about bringing cases, um, of course, we would tell them that they're, you know, they could be, uh, they could receive compensation, uh, or the court could award moral and, and material damages. No one was interested in those moral and material damages. Everyone said, "No, I want to bring my case because I want recognition." You know, the Russian government is denying that anything anything happened. Um, you, you talk about the Yandiev um, case where um, a Russian soldier on camera or a Russian general on camera gives an order to execute a, a, a prisoner. Um, and the Russian prosecutor's office, <clears throat> in response to a, a complaint, uh, writes to the, the mother and to Memorial, well, the body has not been found, so we can't open a criminal investigation. Right? I mean, that... So the Russians were just denying that there was any wrongdoing in any of these cases. Um, and what the court has, what we've been able to do through the court is actually get recognition that yes, the Russian government was responsible for these killings, for these disappearances. And I think that's a moral victory that is really, really important for, for many of, um, of the victims that, that we've represented over the years. Um, and so it's not just, you know, the money is only a small, a small part of it. But I have to say, once you win the case, the, you know, the, 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 the applicants actually do want the money because they, most of them are desperately poor. And so if, you know, if the court awards them 50,000 euros, that is going to, you know, that's going to, uh, that's really going to make an impact on, 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 their, on their lives. And often they've lost, um, you know, they've lost breadwinners and, and so on. Um, so that, I mean, certainly is a secondary issue for most of, uh, most of the people that we represented, um, but, um, uh, but not an unimportant one. Thank you, Deirdre. And thank you, Emma, for being so patient as you took all of these comments and criticisms and suggestions. So I, I do want to give you a chance now to respond to the various presenters. Could we get the light, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> the sun's setting here so that our mood doesn't become... Um, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you so much. Well, I have five minutes. Um, you have time. So, okay. Um, I just... I, I might go backwards somewhat. Um, and I'm... I hope, Deirdre, that, um, that the chapter didn't come across as unduly harsh on the European Court. I, I think that wasn't my intention, actually. And um, in many respects, I used that um, notion of the fee for human life because for some people that I had talked to, that was how they equated it. Mm. And it's a very strong quote um, and uh. perhaps slightly misused in, in that sense. But, the degree to which I guess that I support what's happening at the European Court of Human Rights is I'm actually writing an article now on the ways in which um, the judgments of the court are helping us to understand the conflict better. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that regard, I totally agree with you uh, about um, the documentation. Um, okay. Um, the... Um, when I said, uh, you said that, um, that the role of the court is a controversial one and you felt that perhaps I'd mischaracterised that. Um, that actually uh, wasn't, 
wasn't my role wasn't to to mischaracterize it. I think um, what I was trying to say was that although these cases are extremely important, um, what I found lacking was evidence that the role of the court, not only by paying compensation, but actually part of their role is to pressure the Russian government and the Russian judiciary to change their practices inside Russia to actually do something about uh, solving the problems themselves so they don't over, you know, as you know, they're overloaded with uh, cases at the European Court of Human Rights. So I guess, um, you know, having talked to Philip Leach and Bill Baring and people who are actually working on that, they themselves hasn't seen any evidence that that is really working on a significant level. So in a sense, I guess my, my claim was that this has sort of been outsourced, if you like, um, and the role of the court, it seems that they don't have the capability to put the structure in place to actually keep the pressure on the Russian government. Um, so that was one of my, one of my concerns. Um, and um, so that, that, that was that. Um, I will go back now to Kim and, and Jason's um, uh, ooh, sorry, issues. Um, okay. I have to make the claim uh, with regard to Kim that I don't deal with the period of Ramzan Kadyrov. Uh, I mean, really, my book start, stops in 2005 when Masharov dies. Um, so there is a, a period of, of when you're talking about, I guess, largely from 2004 to 2010 that I don't, that's not actually the, the period that I deal with. Um, but that said, uh, I think your criticism about political economy is, is, a, is a correct one. Um, and that I probably don't give as much um, uh, traction to that argument as I do to arguments about racism and nationalism. And so I think in terms of understanding the conflict, I would, I would absolutely agree that, that there's a shortage of that, if you like, within the book itself. Um, I think that you said um, that I make the claim that Russian nationalists or Rus radical Chechen separatists were really driven by revenge. And I don't actually make that claim all the way throughout my book. I think that very much the character of that um, resistance changes. And it does split very much between Shamil Basayev and Aslan Masharov. Yes, there are the other factors at work, but these two have the main power base within that society. And so therefore, I guess that I concentrated on them. I also concentrated on them because there was a lack of material for me about what the other factors, the other groups were doing. And I don't know if any of you have read uh, Ilya Sakhmadov's new book, uh, The Chechen Independence Movement. He was the former foreign minister. It's just come out with Palgrave. And in fact, that book gives us a very nuanced uh, understanding uh, of what's going on both with Shamil Basayev and what's going on with Aslan Masharov, with whom he worked with both these men. So he does give you a sense that really up until the death of Masharov, the struggle was with Masharov trying to unify Shamil Basayev so there wouldn't be a civil war with inside Chechnya itself. So um, I think that that could have been elaborated on if I'd known more. I wish I had. Um, and uh, so I think that's a point very, very well taken and, and, and I, I agree. Um, the issue about uh, the concentration of my book being just on racism and nationalism, um, I think that's slightly unfair um, because I think I point out in the introduction that this is just one aspect of this particular war that I think has been marginalized in our discussions. And perhaps if I talked more about political economy, I could have slightly offset that more, right? To, to make that, uh, give the sense that I'm only introducing one lens through which we could try and understand this campaign. So um, the issue of, of genocide, um, I don't actually say that it's genocide for a start. I actually make the claim that I think by international law that we could call this crimes against humanity. And the reason why I make that claim is because with crimes against humanity, you can make the claim that if there, there's racial prejudice that drives or motivates people to commit particular crimes, but you don't have to prove intent, right? So 
And also, I think that I, I, I make the claim very much, as Deirdrick said, right, that it is up to battalion leaders. I can't prove that there's any state policy. And I mean, again, if we look at uh, Russians during the Second World War, for example, then it is very much determined by battalion commanders who are making decisions. I can't prove, I have no, absolutely no evidence to say that the Russians are directed from yep. the FSB or whatever to commit crimes against civilians. Um, so I just wanted to be to be clear about that and and hope that that's uh, not exactly misunderstood. But I think in a book about Chechnya, you have to address that issue precisely because so many Chechens are convinced that, that that's what has happened to them. Um, and so I think to try and deconstruct that in a way that's um, that's helpful in terms of international law might help us um, uncut some of that. Um, now, sorry, Jason, uh, the, the last thing was about Russians, uh, and I think that's a really good point, right? I, I'm, I'm prepared to accept that I don't um, draw them into the discussion. I mean, I think that I do draw Russian civil society into the discussion very much, uh, looking at Politkovskaya, looking at the role of Memorial, looking at the role of the Russian Chechen Friendship Society and, and the, the role of the advocates. But if you're, I guess you're asking me to do uh, more, you know, survey-based work about how Russians feel about, about Chechens. Um, so, and I, I didn't do a lot, lot of that, precisely time and, and money and, and I think it's a, it's a very difficult thing um, to sort of uh, generate real data about. I mean, one can do it, but you, as everybody knows with surveys, you, you only have a, but that wasn't, I mean, one could have done that, but, but clearly, clearly I didn't. Um, did I answer all those questions? Um, <laughs> was there some? <laughs> Well, no, I, I wanted to because I think that they're all really good points. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, there was, there was clarity about um, my, you know, what I was trying to get through. And sometimes I think that it's when someone's reading something, you don't like to be misinterpreted, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I just wanted to, to make sure that that, that was clear. Um, the, oh, oh sorry. I guess um, one thing that Jason brought up, which I would slightly disagree with, um, is the fact that um, when you're talking about racism, that somehow you have to prove um, that because it's not a homogenous attack on all racial groups, that it's not driven by racism. I mean, you're saying that essentially the pattern of the ways in which the crisis occurred suggests that, okay, Urus Matan, Stariyatagi, there are areas in Agun, right, where there was a lot of fighting going on. Um, but I, I, I could never make the suggestion that racism isn't a motivating factor precisely because it doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and I, I think that if I miss, I may have misunderstood you. Um, no, go on. Well, as for me, I mean, this is the thing. I'm, I'm still trying to pin you down on, on what your argument is because and this genocide conversation has actually been very helpful for that because you want to talk, it's not genocide, and I think that's yes, very clear, but it's crimes against humanity. And I think that's where you want to put it, um, which assumes then that this is being done for racial and or ethnic. Doesn't assume that, doesn't because you don't have to buy crimes all. against humanity. Okay. Do, it, racism okay. can be one of the okay. factors, but it's the, the genesis behind crimes against humanity is it has to be widespread and systematic. So that's okay. the question I'm asking, right? Can, could we prove that it's widespread and systematic? Okay, so I, I think that I'm confused on what you mean by racism and nationalism and what it's doing in your account. I think that's where I would say, because when I look at the, the patterns, I see variation. And I, so there's some places getting completely ransacked, some places untouched, the north, the north of the Tarak. Could I interject here? I wonder if Emma's talking about strategy and you're talking about tactics or operations. Potentially. And if, 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 Emma, would you like to make another couple points that we'll throw it out and just allow sort of rebuttal? And, and well, well, Jason might want to elaborate. No, no, you, no, you, it's your show. No, 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 because I, I, I mean, I'm interested in Kim's question. She thinks that we're slightly misinterpreting each other. Um, 
I, my understanding is that Jason is talking about um, underneath the Windows update um, how, <laughs> how things worked when the decision was made that war was going to be fought. And what he's saying is that in different cities there were different levels of attacks against civilians. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is that one of the motivating factors that caused the war to happen at all was the Russian hatred of Chechens. No, I didn't. No, no, no. I, I never said that that caused the war. I think you're saying it's one of the causes, and I'm not going to let you back down on that because all three of that, us read that in your book. Well, <laughs> no, I don't think that I say. I think it's a motivating factor in the causal origins of the war, but I don't say that it's the sole and only motivating factor. Oh, I don't think factor. you said that either. But, but that's you how you're presenting that. it, though, right? But then, if Jason makes the claim, right, that um, just because it's not widespread, right? complete brutalization of all parts of Chechnya, that there's no racism involved. I, I, well, don't, I don't think, I think that's that. a... No, that's not what I'm saying. What, but what I'm trying to say is, I think what we're trying to do is push you from the description of the conflict mm -hmm. to the analysis of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, and this may be a disciplinary divide. I don't know yeah. from history, it's historians political and political science versus history. Yeah. So I want to know, I, I want to know not just what happened, mm -hmm. I want to know why. Yeah. And, and so when you say to me, well, this racism and nationalism, this plays a very important role in the origins of the conflict and in the conduct of the war, mm -hmm. the part of me that's a political scientist says, okay, show me, mm -hmm. right? Versus other factors. And I, I think historians get away with a little bit because, and I'm not saying you do, but I'm saying historians in general, because they know the world is complicated. They're very uncomfortable with just one factor or two sure. factors. Everything yeah. matters, but that's what the political scientists bangs their head against the wall and says, I know everything is good. I know everything, and I know the world is complicated, but I want to know, because you, you do emphasize it on page 206 in your conclusion, you're very clear, <laughs> is racism and, and, and nationalism is one of the key drivers of the conflict, and I'm saying, I don't think that's right, but I want to know how you would know that that's and I just want to say in here, you've backed off, and we have sort of ignored the great discussion that you have of the aerial bombing campaigns. And I think that really helps your evidence, perhaps even more than the question of what members of the FSB battalion still I guess I take those for granted, actually. I mean, I, I think that I take, I, I mean, perhaps I've, I take the, the disproportionality argument for granted, and I should draw that more to, to, to the table. Um, and I think that there are two cases of that, you know, both the aerial bombing in the first and the second war, uh, and also the fact that, and, and Diedrich would know this well, absolutely no state of emergency called, absolutely no evacuation routes set up for people to actually get out of the country. So I think I actually pose the question in the book, is this a case of negligence, right? Or is this, you know, a racial, prof a, a, a consequence of racism? And I can't, I, I'm not saying, I can't answer that question though. But it's a, but can, you can't either. So can can, can you tell me and that? say that I, I have heard at least that a number, a very large number of the people that were killed in the aerial bombing campaigns were elderly Russians. No, that's the first war. First war. Well, but the fact that the same technique was used in both wars indicates that the second war can't be racist if the first war wasn't racist. But I didn't say, I, didn't say I guess I didn't say that the first war wasn't racist. I mean, uh, I never said that either. So, um, and I, I think that racism did partly drive the first war, but I think that um, it wasn't as much as the second war. And I think the precise reasons for that are the actions of the Chechen separatists themselves, right? The fact that they led the incursion into Dagestan they, there's no evidence to suggest that they're responsible for the apartment bombings, but the collective wisdom is, right, that at least they play, they may have played some role, right? So also I think that the, the Russian military was extremely um, upset that it so-called lost the first war and so wanted to go back and achieve what it set out to achieve in the, that didn't achieve in, in the first war. Um, so... Look. Yeah. yeah. No, go on. Yeah, no, I, it, that's, I, this is fascinating and actually very productive along disciplinary and, and all sorts of comparative lines, so it's great. But one thing I think we can do is maybe bring in some audience members. Take three. Please keep your comments or questions very short. Identify yourselves, who you are, as with your institutional affiliation. Please realize that the transcript is being made so that you will be on the record. And so let's take one round and then let's bundle some server bottle to rebuttals in with answers okay. to, to the questions kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Dr. Palmer, President of the CMA Veritas International, and I made many documentary films in Russia, and I was working for 
Russian television in Siberia at one point. And my way of looking at this is by a film that was actually shown at the Hammond Institute. The film took place in Chechnya. Help me out with the name. It was about a madhouse, and it suggested that the people, what's the name of the film? But in any way, it suggested the people inside the madhouse were actually more sane than the Russian soldiers and the Chechen soldiers who were fighting outside and were giving, one was giving drugs and the other one was giving arms. Which suggests to me that the reason this film is so popular is because Russia is a corrupt society. It has been for a very long time. There is no surprise about this. And a lot of the arguments here as to why it happened or why this happened or that happened is because the social construction of reality for both the Russians and the Chechens was a society built on corruption and they just fell right back into it. The rebels will go over and work, um, be part of the other side and so on. That's my point. Okay, thank you. Other, other points, questions? Jack. So I wanted to ask you all to follow up on the issue that you raised about how you would convince Russians not to uh, approach such a conflict in the way that they did uh, in this war, since they might very well say, but it's working, we won the war. And so one question is, did they win the war? I thought the objective of the second Chechen war was to stop terrorism, and yet, we, as, as has been pointed out, we just had the terrorist attack on the airport, so didn't solve that problem, it doesn't look like. And um, maybe also, in, in the same vein, can somebody com comment on what strategic and tactical lessons the Russians thought they had learned from the first Chechen war, how they adopted their strategy and tactics for the second war, and did they learn the, the right lessons, and did they implement the lessons in a way that actually worked by their own standards? Great, thanks, Jack. And there was one more comment here. Yeah, I was Gardner, Fordham University. Um, just a question, I guess, for Jason about this work up here. I, I mean, I'm just getting my feet wet with Chechnya, but it's uh, there is some variation in terms of the specific ethnic groups, and I'm I'm wondering how the the, the ethnic groups and, and maybe some of the variations in, in Islam um, play into into that into the work that they are the patterns that you see here. Okay, you mean Chechnya proper? In Chechnya proper, yeah, in terms of uh, where the Swedes were and so forth. Great, okay, so a lot to sink our teeth into, and let's just go in order. Yeah, I mean, I can answer Jack's uh, second question about the strategic and tactical lessons. Um, I think in the case of the first war that uh, the evidence suggests that they sent in, you know, 18 and 19 year old uh, foot soldiers who'd actually been, had never trained together in some instances and were sent into the capital and had no idea, uh, you know, what they were doing. And plus they were fighting against uh, Chechens who were very uh, aware of what the, the physical terrain was, both in the mountains and within Grozny uh, itself. So what they did learn was that they had to privately contract soldiers with a great deal more experience and that they would use the, the common soldier, right, in the, in the cases of the sweeps, they would use the common soldier to surround the village and then the privately contracted soldier would do the harsher, more brutal work, if you like. Um, so in that respect, they did learn a big lesson um, and that they, they knew that they had to work in smaller, tactical, very, very strong units. The other thing that was different was that they stopped, uh, they, they bombed their area for about three months, which they did similarly in the first war. But essentially what they did was that they prohibited ground troops from going in too quickly. So. The consensus is that the bombing during the second war was far more widespread and far more um, damaging than it had been in the first war. So their, their operational tactic was to save their own men and then to use these stronger units. And uh, The question of whether they've won or not, uh, it depends on where you're, what perspective you're coming from, <laughs> whether you're coming from a moral perspective, whether you're coming from a political perspective. Um, and uh, so they've managed to quieten the situation for the time being. 
Um, I mean, I'm not sure, as Ilya Sakhmatov has just recently said in his book, that you know this is not going to change the situation once Chechens have a, the, the, the opportunity to rest. They're going to rise up again. I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, actually. I think that there's, there's a, a sort of idealism in, in, in that itself. Um, but um, Ramzan Kadyrov is not uh, the answer for them. Um, I want to sort of talk about uh, Jack Snyder's question about, uh, I'm not going to answer the first one exactly on the military operational lessons that were learned, but about um, what they have done now and what they, how you'd make the argument that it hasn't served their interests. I think the key change between the two wars was the decision to move over to Chechenization um, and to give uh, essentially control over the territory to Ramzan Kadyrov and his forces. And I'm going to take Jason on very strongly on this. I think that Putin has lost control. I think it was a gradual process that started in 2004, 2005. And by 2009, 2010, Ramzan Kadyrov's forces had operational control over all of the security operations that were happening on the territory. There were still Russian forces that were left on the ground, but they were only leaving their barracks when they were ordered to because of Ramzan Kadyrov's orders that came through the operational um, mechanisms. There was no longer uh, anybody in the federal level, FSB or MVD, the uh, internal security forces, that had operational um, uh, mandate over what Ramzan Kadyrov was doing. He doesn't have any power outside of Chechnya. Um, and they demonstrated that by foiling one of uh, an apparent assassination attempt against one of his rivals in Moscow. But inside Chechnya, there's nobody who can touch him. Um, and one of the things that happened just this past year that makes that even clearer is that Ramzan was given control over an international airport that opened up again in uh, Chechnya for the first time since the fighting had started. There are still a few Russian FSB officers who check passports there, but it's a few ethnic Russians in this huge sea of heavily armed, um, very corrupt um, Chechen militants who are you know um, holding up millions of dollars to pay them off and also the threat of having an accident happen on their way back to Russia um, if they don't go along with what the forces want um, and um, so essentially the airport has meant that Ramzan can look elsewhere for other patrons outside of Moscow and uh, the work that I do in the book demonstrates that that's a common pattern among warlords they look for alternatives and Ramzan has every incentive and every mechanism to look for alternatives and so the best argument I think you can make to the Russians about what they did wrong is you lost control over a piece of your territory. You're absolutely right. You didn't end terrorism by doing that. Damajedovo was just the latest one. It may not be as many suicide bombings as was happening in 2001, but it's been going up the last couple of years in terms of the number of victims and in terms of the number of terrorist attacks that have happened. That's been very well documented by CSIS and Sarah Mendelssohn's work. But I, but I think if the Russians had all decided that they wanted to go in, they could just go in. Uh, and, and do I, what? Well, and get rid of Ramzan Kadyrov. And replace him with who? Really, I don't know who they would place him with. Well, I don't think that it's simple that they've lost control. They, they would mean, have to go in with a major military intervention and they would have to fight Ramzan Kadyrov's forces. Yeah, which they're quite capable of doing and that they will do if they feel as though they're losing the region. They've already done it before. It doesn't matter mm. whether it's Aslan Masharov or whether oh, it's Ramzan Kadyrov. I think it's a big difference. No, I don't think it does. Is, is that it? Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, I don't want to talk to Kim, but actually I should answer Jack's question too. I mean, I, I agree. I think they learned, the Russians learned a lot, actually, the, the airstrikes as a way of preventing their own soldiers from dying. I, I think the other thing they did, which we haven't been talking about, is this clamp down on media, right? I mean, this is not the first, like the first Chechen war when most of the journalists could be on the battlefield. This is much more of an information blockade. Although surprisingly, we have a lot more information than I think we would had that blockade been that effective. But they still nonetheless tried to clamp down on it being shown at home very casually averse at the beginning. The Chechenization, I think, is, is critical, right? They learn very quickly that they do not want to be doing the sweeps. In fact, in these data, you can see right around 2004, the Chechens start doing more of the sweeps than the Russians do. They, they're definitely handing it off. Uh, something we're seeing, for example, in Iraq or Afghanistan as well. So I think it's a common kind of a, um, a strategy to get yourself out of the box. Uh, the contract soldiers, I think, were also very good. But you mentioned the contract soldiers. And the final thing is, this is a very different war than the first one because the Chechens were the first. And in this case, uh, the Russians had more of an excuse to enter than I think than the, uh, than the first war. And so the Chechens, the rebels, they, they bear the onus. Well, the radicals onus. within the Chechens. Well, I mean, for the Russian point of view, this is fantastic, right? I mean, sure. This is, this is absolutely allows you to paint them as terrorists, allows them to paint them as the aggressor, and this is a pleasing mm -hmm. operation moving back across the border. But you didn't really have in the first war, and so that split the movement. I mean, and you have a lot of Chechens who fought in the first war who did not fight in the second war. They're still on the sidelines because of the nature of the war, because it did not agree with the Zayas' move to Dagestan. And so I think the, 
the Russians have played that to the hilt. And they played it internationally, too, which we haven't really talked about, the international terrorism card, right, and how this kind of gives the Russians the ability to, um, to, do, their, to do their strategy in the way that they're going to do. Um, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to do like, I want, I want to do that very quickly. I don't want to do on counterfactuals because I think, frankly, none of us really know. And it's one of these things where Ramzan could be incredibly strong and survive another 10 years. He could go tomorrow. Yeah, that's and dangerous. He could go tomorrow. He could go tomorrow, so we don't actually know. My sense, though, is that um, he has a, every incentive to play up how strong he is. I think that we have to be careful. I just don't, I think the Russians have more levers than he does. I know he's got the airport now, but the Russians are pumping tons of money through. Right, they, have a, they have a financial, like all that corruption, all that money coming in. They could shut that off. And then right? what would happen? And then what would happen? What? If they shut off the money. Pull down Ramzan. Right? And then what happens? Then they fight another civil war. But that doesn't mean necessarily he doesn't, they don't control him, right? Right? So he, they could just shut the spigot off. That's one way of doing it. They could actually just have a divide and rule strategy where the Chechens are fighting themselves. Can put the walls up containing this, right, and let the Chechens fight and try and contain the spillover, which I think is what's going on now, right? The, the problem for the Russians is not that the Chechens are killing themselves right now. That's not the problem. The problem is that they are actually leaking outside and blowing up airports and things like that. That's for the Russians. That's the problem. So I think they figured. I think they think they figured out the Chechen case, but they haven't actually locked down the terrorism. But frankly, I mean, right now, from where this looked in 2003, 2004, this might actually count as a Russian success, right? You have a small amount of terrorist incidents. You sort of, can, if you're right, you keep playing up the nationals card, the national security card, you can justify more democratic erosion if there's any democracy left, right? So it's not necessarily clear this is a failure. Until Ramzan starts cooperating with one of the enemies or Ramzan gets bumped off. I agree, but none of us know what's going to happen with Ramzan when he yeah. goes down, right? <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, well, I, I mean, I'll contribute to this discussion about Ramzan and whether Russia has has won or or lost this war. And I think it depends very much on how you define winning or losing, right? I mean, the way you're putting it, um, yes, maybe they they have won, but I I, I, mean, I, I think that Ramzan has um, control far beyond. Actually, I mean, you were you were saying that he doesn't have control in Moscow, but at the same time, he has been assassinating people in in Moscow. He's assassinated people in in the Gulf. He just did um, one, he's, or, he's apparently did one last week. Oh, um, um, we have the case in in Austria. Um, um, we know that in Austria and Norway and other places, the the Chechen diaspora is is frightened, is really frightened because Ramzan has his informers everywhere, and it goes way, you know, it goes well beyond just the Moscow diaspora. It's it's all over the place. Um, and I, I mean, if you look at back, look back at August 1996, um, the Russians had also set up this kind of loyalist Chechen police. And the moment they saw that the you know the winds were changing, they switched sides, and suddenly, I mean, the loyalties of these you know the people that Ramzan has has um, surrounded himself with, both to Ramzan himself, are very um, uh, tenable, and then to the you know the kind of pro-Russian cause is very tenable. That can change at any moment, and the whole you know you're back to a completely different situation than you um, than you have right now. So I think it, it continues to be really volatile. Um, and um, I mean, if if winning is creating a kind of more you know a stable society, obviously Russia has has totally failed at, at doing that um, in pursuing its own political interests. I, you know, I'm not so sure that they are really all that comfortable with what is going on um, uh, right now. Um, I wanted to go back to one. Um, uh, one one thing you said, Emma, this is not related to the, uh, the questions, but um, about the European court and how it had not been able to change practices inside Russia. Um, I want to make two points about that. One is, of course, we don't know to what extent it has changed practices because if the you know if fewer abuses are taking place, is that because there's more scrutiny from mm -hmm. the European Court, et cetera, um, or is that because or, or would that have happened without the European Court? I mean, it's one of these things that we just you know we cannot really know. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, changing, I mean, where where we do know that there has not been a change is in how uh, Russian uh, Russian prosecutors are investigating allegations of of abuses. Mm -hmm. um, we've not seen any real change in, in how that happens no matter uh, no matter that the European Court in every single judgment ha it has issued has been scathing about the yeah. way Russia has conducted in its investigations um, but the court 
um, has a judicial function. It is, um, it is the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe that has the political function of making sure that judgments are actually uh, implemented. And so there we're actually back at the earlier chapters uh, in, in your book talking about the lack of political will to really deal with yeah. what is going on in, uh, in, in, in Russia and in Chechnya. And so it really, you know, the, the court can only is issue these judgments. It can mandate certain changes to legislation for example, but when it comes to kind of established practices in the prosecutor's office or in the military, um, it requires political will process. on the part of the Russian government to make those changes. And I mean, we all know that that is not going to come just like that, so that is going to require the, the, the Council of Europe you know, the political uh, arms of the, of the Council of Europe actually putting the pressure on Russia to, to make that happen, and that, um, that, is not, that has not been happening. Yeah. Great. Let's take uh, a couple more. Yes. Um, my question is. Uh, Where are you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Anna. I'm senior in the Barnes Law Department. Um, there seems to be a consensus. We didn't discuss this uh, matter in detail, but there seems to be a consensus that um, the vast majority of international efforts to intervene um, on the level of human rights abuses have either been non existent or failed, with the exception of the ECHR. Um, so what are alternatives to waiting for a potential governmental or non-governmental criminal tribunal to take place? What can be done in the present to bring some sort of international recognition and some effort at like, <coughs> reconciliation within Chechnya um, in terms of the trauma that has been suffered on a national scale? Great. Thanks. Uh, question? Yeah, I'm Jack Kahn, just a Columbia alumnus. Uh, and could you clarify who these contract soldiers are? Are they highly skilled Russian nationals or foreign mercenaries? Yeah. Uh, one more? You want to ask one more question? Yes, please. Uh, why is one? I take classes here sometimes. I was wondering if, um, looking at the conflict, um, looks at things in terms of, you know, countries having to prove themselves, like people have to prove themselves, you know? You talk about the vast accumulation of wealth in Russia now, right? It's compensation, maybe, you know, compensating for the fact that the Soviet Union uh, wasn't exactly a financial success, you know? And then you look at the Chechens in terms of having to prove themselves um, as being uh, a group that is, that is capable or, or, or has the right to be you know, a real nation among nations. I was wondering if there's, if there's, if there are NGOs or whatever that serve as intermediaries. I can see that, you know, instead of playing off one group against another, uh, trying to find, you know, um, human solutions in terms of, you know, people trying to help each other, like you said about people being so poor and getting financial compensation is some sort of incentive, you know, without imposing it too strongly. But you know, having an intermediary that seems to care, you know, this more in terms of caring, you know, caregivers, you know. Right. So, so what are the conditions for the NGO role in this? Okay, good. So let's see if we can spark some even more debate uh, in the panel and our last minutes. I'll ask everyone to limit responses to two minutes, and then we'll vote. Okay. All right. Uh, just with regard to the contract soldiers, as far as I know, they're, they're, they're Russian nationals. Uh, I, I have no evidence otherwise to, to suggest that uh, there are any foreign fighters. Um, so I don't think Kadyrov's got quite the same currency as Gaddafi. Um, so um, I, I don't think that's <laughs> as far as I know, yeah. Um, with regard to your, your question, and um, I, I thank you for that. Um, I think uh, that Diedrich's point about the testimonies or the, the judgments coming out of the European Court of Human Rights is a, is a very valid one, and I, I think that's, that's a place that we should continue looking at. But for me, that doesn't really um, go to the heart of what I think is, is problematic here. And I must say that, my, my, for me personally, that I like the idea of public hearings. And 
public hearings as a venue where, um, in this case, I don't think it would take place in Chechnya, but I think it could take place, for example, amongst the Chechen diaspora living in Austria, of which there are 16,000 that we're currently trying to work with, to, to set up panels where you do have um, people being able to talk about what took place and to have transcripts made and to have discussion generated. So, um, sorry. Sir, in your book, I think in the introduction, you made mention of the fact that language tends to get repetitive. And, I mean, in that, like, essentially postmodern um, instance, it fails often because of its repetition and its reality to uh, grasp Mm -hmm. Do you think that such panels would be an effective way to sort of bear such I guess, I guess you've got to ask the question of, of who is the panel for? Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, the panel's not really for us. Uh, the panel is for people who have been victimised and for them to have the opportunity to you know, as Diedrich said, to gain recognition, uh, but also to gain recognition within their community uh, about what's about what's taken place. And if you aren't, if you're a victim of a historical crime and you're not going to get recognition within the normal avenues of justice, then I really think that you know it's it's not enough to just do documentation and research, you know, um, I, I think that these issues need, we need to think about ways in which we can bring people together that aren't about truth and reconciliation commissions as such or, or as international criminal tribunals, but, but where people get the opportunity to be heard because we're always going to have asymmetrical wars where these things aren't going to happen. Right. Can we skip to you because I know you've got to run off. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so one of the uh, about the, the idea of hearings, um, one of the things that the European Court does not do mm -hmm. is grant a role for applicants. So the victims don't actually play really any role in the proceedings. Um, we interview them. We make a you know kind of a, um, a, we base our appli the application on what the person has told us. We kind of verify the evidence they present, etc. Um, but they are never called to the court to actually testify about what happened to them. Um, even in the rare cases where the court does schedule a, a kind of a public hearing in one of these cases, um, it's actually the representative of the applicant who speak. And so in the, the one case in which we had a hearing um, of uh, the mother of uh, Yandiev, um, um, who you describe in, the, uh, uh, in, in your book, um, um, she came to Strasbourg, but she was never able to actually speak herself. Um, and so clearly if, if we're looking at, I mean, obviously the recognition is really important, but if we're looking at people actually being able to, to speak their mind, to talk about what happened to them, to offload a lot of that emotional baggage, that is not happening at, um, at all at, at the moment. Um, uh, in terms of um, um, the kind of um, efforts to bring people together to bridge the, the, the differences. Of course, there have, been, there have been groups that have been working on kind of peace building, on bringing Russians and Chechens together and have them, um, you know, have them experience things together, do fun stuff together, bringing children, Russian and, and Chechen children together. Um, the problem is that you're really, I mean, these efforts are fighting against a media apparatus that is feeding <coughs> hatred um, uh, to, uh, to the Russian population um, um, ab about Chechens. Um, I mean, I, I have good friends in Russia who, when I tell them about the work I've been doing and about people who've disappeared, you know, they are convinced that these people must have done something wrong. Um, and, and even when I tell them, you know, then at least they should have, you know, criminal proceedings. Um, they, you know, they don't, they don't buy that. Um, and so um, you're fighting against a tide that is so much more powerful than a few NGOs can do to kind of bring people together and, and help bridge these, um, you know, kind of misunderstandings that, that exist on, on, on both sides. It's a, you know, it's a very, very difficult undertaking. Thank you. I can. 
Yeah, um, on Anna's question, um, I think there's very little that the United States as an actor can do because the reset is just sort of working. We need Russia in North Korea, Iran for um, <coughs> liberation reasons. We need their cooperation in Afghanistan. Um, so um, there's not going to be a lot of government attention to it. That's why the ECHR is so unique because it's a state-based agency that nonetheless can have an impact on things. Um, but it's not clear how much power states have anyway to get change inside other states. And so I think the answer to your question is publicity. And Emma Gilligan's book helped a lot in bringing publicity to these issues, and I think an upcoming event that has an opportunity to bring publicity is the Olympics in Sochi. Um, I think that that is something that I would guess human rights advocates are going to rally around to bring attention to what's happening in the North Caucasus. Jason, uh, I'm not sure I can approve on that as a, as a sort of finale. I'm actually sort of torn intellectually on the idea of a war crimes tribunals or these um, committees and things like that. Uh, into morally. We'd love to have them. Intellectually, I'd love to have them because we get great data and we figure out what happened in the course of this conflict and actually record all of these abuses. Uh, but the other part of me, I think we have to be careful with this, partly because we're outsiders, and I would want to know what the Chechens think about the actual one, if they want a war crime tribunal. Um, sometimes these work uh, wonderfully, and we have a lot of comparative cases where they do. Uh, some cases, these tribunals and committees and crimes actually prepare to perpetuate uh, or create new forms of violence. And if we aren't very careful, we might just actually kick over another sound round of score settling and disputes and things like that. So before we did anything, I mean, hypothetically speaking, because I don't think the Russians are going to do this themselves, uh, I would certainly want to know what the Chechens themselves thought about the wisdom of actually doing a score settling or a, or a war crimes tribunal. But it, morally, um, I mean, I agree. I mean, we push you pretty hard on, on whether these are crimes against humanity. But I mean, the amount of violence that's visited on the Chechen population is, is staggering. And I think the book it does a fantastic job in at least bringing that to light, too. So I, I agree with Kim. I think that's a great way to end. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we thank our panelists. First, talking of large-scale violence and what uh, Soviet World War II commanders were thinking, uh, the Red and Snyder panel that's going to happen right across the hallway in a little bit. So if you want to be cheered up even more, uh, you can go there. Second announcement, Wednesday at noon, next event in the series, 12.19, noon to 1.30, Sveta Petrova, a postdoc at Harvard, will be presenting her work on human rights networks in East Europe, and her policy making and discussing will be Lenny Bernardo of the Open Society Institute, so that should be a good match there. So please join us for this crowd back at noon on Wednesday. Thank you to the panelists. It's been a fantastic discussion. Really. Incredible.